you know, as our traditional growth. And basically what we're saying is how do we create a handshake between the product team and the sales team such that, oh, okay, sorry, I'm supposed to be projecting this. Aha. How do we create a handshake between the product team and the sales team such that, you know, they work hand in hand together and how do they work together? And, you know, what are the, what's the relationship between both of them? Okay. So without further ado, what exactly is product-led growth? Product-led growth to a large extent is basically just, you know, allowing the user to experience the product before actually making a, before making a purchase. I, I, I love using this example. You want to buy a car and you go to, you want to buy a car and you go to a dealership and you ask for, you ask for, say, I don't know, let me dream. I want to buy a gum. So I walk into the dealership and I ask, I want to see, I want to buy a G-Wagon. They typically would give you a brochure. Um, the brochure gives you an idea of what the car is or what the car does, you know, the function, uh, what's called the features and the functions. So for example, I want to see things like when I sit in the car, it, it heats up and it wraps around me and gives me a big hug and tells me, oh, well done, you've had a, a, a very rough day. Anyway, but obviously, it's one thing to, you know, read a book about something. It's another thing to actually experience it. So the next step is you take a, you take a test drive and, you know, you go on a test drive with the car, you feel it, you enjoy it, and you want to, you know, you try it out basically. And you come back from your test drive. By the time you come back from your test drive, I can assure you that what you knew about the car, even if you had read all the documentations, that were given to you or that were available before you know taking that test drive it's um that test drive okay in fact let's not go far i used to hate g-wagons then i drove one in a few years ago maybe 2017 2018 i drove one i've been in love since then like i literally used to hate the car because i don't exactly like boxy cars but i drove that car um, anyway, so let's continue talking about uh, PLG. So basically, that's what it is, you know, leading with the product, showing the customer the value of that product, showing the customer what they, what they stand to gain by taking on that product, allowing them to explore the product, it's, uh, what's it called, the product, and then the product will basically convince the customer to make a buying decision. Product-led growth is not... Is not something that fell out of the sky. It's basically one of the possible strategies that you can use to go to the market. Um, so, you know, typically we, you hear go to market a lot when people are talking about launching a new product. But go to market is not necessarily a launching a new product thing. So, yes, most of the time, you know, the time that you need to design or plan for plan your go-to-market activities or your go-to-market strategy is usually around the time when you're launching a new product. Taking a product from inception to success, it takes a lot. And there's, you know, there's a lot of planning that goes into it. There's a lot of decisioning that goes into, into that. So for example, as part of your um, go-to-market strategy, you need to decide how you're distributing the product, how the customer is reaching, how, how you're reaching the customer, how the customer is discovering the product, which is where PLG comes in. So there are four widely known goods market strategies today for um, technology products. Uh, the most common one, which, is, uh, which we are familiar with, is sales-led growth. Sales-led growth, you know, we already know, is the traditional go and qualify a lead, uh, discuss with the customer, evaluate the prospect, and convert the customer and, you know, earn your income. Uh, then there is... Marketing-led growth. Marketing-led growth is basically, you know, you are bombarding the customer or the prospect with information about your product. You are telling the prospect at every point in time. You are trying to act, um, you are trying to get top of mind awareness with your customer. And you are trying to uh, with your prospective customer because they're not your customer yet. They're still the, the so basically marketing-led growth actually focuses more on. The awareness, aspect, the awareness and adoption part of um, the customer journey, of the customer acquisition journey. So the acquisition journey goes from when the customer is aware of the product 
until when they are converted, meaning that you know when they learn about your product and when they actually start using it or when they become an ad, when they become your advocate. So when, the, for example, as I just told you, if you want to buy car, go and buy Jiwa Gong, yeah, something like that. So then you have product-led growth. Product-led growth, we've talked about it. Uh, it's not a new buzzword. Product-led growth is something that has been happening that has been happening for a while. It's just that um, I think to a large extent now, people are starting to become a lot more aware of it because there are a lot of success stories. So you have the Airtable, you have the HubSpot, you have the Calendly, and our local ones here as uh, local um, startups in Nigeria as well. Uh, so for example, I know Square that I'm very close to and familiar with have grown from zero to a million users with by leading with the product. And there are lots of other, you know, other notable organizations like that. You have Slack, for example, even though it took Slack almost 20 years. Okay, uh, then you have community-led growth. Community-led growth is not yet common, it's not yet as common as the other ones, uh, because community most of the time with community-led growth, it means that you are building in public. Not everybody is at that level yet where they are comfortable or confident enough to fail in public. So, but basically what community-led growth is, is that you basically put your product out there for people to, for communities to evaluate. So you have testers, um, testing communities, you have um, enthusiasts that are interested in um, learning, basically early adopters. And, you know, they test your product, they learn about it, they use it, and then they eventually become advocates for that product. Okay, so how does product-led growth work? Um, obviously, it's not a one-size-fits-all. There are different methods and different ways to implement product-led growth. But a few things are a few things are common across organizations or implementations of product-led growth across organizations. So uh, one is <clears throat> the team dynamics. In a PLG organization, it is natural that the, the dynamics of the, of the team will be different from that of a, for example, traditional, traditional sales. Uh, okay, somebody's asking a question. How about open source products as end product of a community? Yes, exactly. So in fact, this is a very, this is a perfect example of community-led growth um, strategy, open source products. Everybody comes in, builds together, and you know, launch the product together, test it together, figure it out together. Thank you for that, Tai. Okay, so back to how PLG works. Uh, I, was, I was talking about the team dynamics. So what you would notice, the first thing you would notice in a product-led organization is that their first focus is on their product team. So just about two, three years ago, product teams mostly didn't have representation in C-level. But over time, with you know the evolution of the product team, the evolution of the product management discipline itself, it's become very clear that, look, there needs to be a focus on product. Even if you're not running a PLG organization, you need to have a team that is that You need to have dedicated product teams. They need to have dedicated leadership. And we can see clearly the differences between organizations that take you know that initiative of empowering product teams. For example, if you look at this presentation, you see that, you know, we have products, the, the teams that are mostly focused on, you have product teams, you have sales, uh, you have marketing. Now, marketing are of two types. So you have product marketing and then you have the core marketing teams. Both of them are just as important because, you know, the job of, so for example, the job of a product marketer is to, is literally product-led growth actually basically to ensure that you know they're getting enough data from the usage of the product to be able to position the product properly and to be able to figure out what exactly customers want so that you know we can provide the value to customers and drive adoption and then customer success why is customer success important so we've called customer success different names over time we've called them support we've called them operations we've called them quite them different things but basically the job of customer success is to ensure that the customer is happy, the customer is deriving the value that they, 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 that you promised to them 
using that product. Then you have different implementation methods of um, product-led growth. So you have the freemium method, which I'm sure, I'm sure we're all familiar with a lot of these methods. So you have the freemium method, which is basically you have a, um, a base version of the product. And then from that base version, you have graduated, <clears throat> excuse me, you have graduated subscription fees, or sometimes you just have a base version that's free. And then you have a paid version that gives you like a, um, like, okay, so Zoom, for example, okay, no, Zoom is still graduated, but, you know, so you have a base free version that is very basic, or well, depending on how the product owner prioritizes the features that they have or that they want to give you, um, that they want to give you access to at the free level. And then you have the paid versions. Then you have trial versions. So you have products like um, Jira and the likes that will give you a, a trial period. No, not Jira. Jira is now freemium. Um, I think it's Asana that does that now. Anyway, so. Now even Netflix, you can do a trial period for maybe one month free. Netflix, eh, okay. So, uh, so you have trial versions, yeah. So it can be, you know, two weeks, three days, five days, um, one month, two weeks, whatever. So basically, what a trial version does is that, or the expectation of the product team in that trial version is they want to hook you. So they're looking for an opportunity to allow so basically they allow you to use the uh, the product in this case they are not even limiting the features that you have access to they're giving you everything for free but just for a limited amount of time and in that time the 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 expectation of the team of the product team is that you would have gotten so comfortable with that product or you would have re, you would have realized the value of that product and you won't you won't want to leave so you would you know, be making a buying decision at the end of your trial period. Uh, then you have other methods like guided demos. So guided demos are really more along the sales line than the PLG line. But why, why I included them here is because a guided demo allows you to actually explore the product. And the whole point of PLG is exploring the product and you know, understanding what the potential value of making that purchase is before actually making the purchase. So a guided demo, uh, the problem with the guided demos is that it requires a, most of the time, an, a, an associate or a, a salesperson to help you through that process. So basically they, somebody, you know, they, there's a set, you set up a session or somebody sets up a session with you and they walk you through the product end to end. Uh, other ways that people have tried to implement product-led growth is um, videos. So, like they do, um, what do we call that thing? I can't remember. Anyway, so there's this thing where, like, it's like it's a demo of some sort as well. But this one is a free is it's freely available. It's not a guided. It's not a demo that you know allows you access into the system or uh, into the product. This is just a a view, a snapshot view of what the features and what the possibilities are. Now, the other thing about products, um, the other, so the other key thing about um, product-led growth is, in fact, the, probably the most important thing actually now, is how in a PLG environment you approach customer acquisition. So remember I mentioned customer acquisition earlier and I talked about it from the perspective of, you know, what the flow and what the journey is. So usually in, okay, uh, we're not there yet. But you know, usually in the traditional, in traditional um, sales process, which Chinedu, who is the expert in sales, will tell us about very soon. But usually in the traditional sales process, you have a flow, you have a funnel, and in that funnel, you know, you basically your your user or your prospects graduates through that funnel, and the funnel comes this way, and at the end of the funnel are your qualified and converted customers. Uh, but in this case, what you have is more of a cycle. And the cycle is in the sense that, so basically, like, you are taking customers from discovery to becoming advocates of your, of your product. And through that process, they are still, they continue to discover because every time for you to maintain and sustain a PLG um, strategy, you have to keep innovating. So look at Calendly, for example. Calendly as at 
2015 or 2017 is not the Calendly that you have today. Even Zoom, as even as of when COVID started and we all started trying to, you know, everybody had to run to Zoom before teams uh, gave us uh, saving grace. Now people have abandoned teams. Anyway, I haven't used Zoom in a long time. And because of the feedback that we got about the team's uh, limitations, I decided to, I decided to, to explore Zoom as an option. And it was, I was massively impressed with the difference in just about a year. So, you know, basically you have to keep, you have to keep innovating because you need to give your customers something to look forward to. You need to give them something to discover every time. So, you know, when you log into a, into your product and you see, oh, um, ding, 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 new features, that, that kind of thing. So basically, you know, you take the customer from discovery to activation. Discovery is when they find out about the product, which most of the time is either from word of mouth or, you know, um, a Google search for them trying to solve a problem or some other marketing-led um, activity. From the point where they discover the product, they go into, acti- uh, they, they adopt the product, they start using it, which is the activation process. Then remember that this is still, most of the time, this is in the free, in the free-ish or freemium, uh, free, free stage of the product. By the time that customer is 100% convinced and they believe in your product, what happens is they convert to paying customers and then they continue to pay. So for example, I, I have decided that I'm going to continue to pay for Zoom because I, I fell in love today. Anyway, so you know, through conversion, retention, and then, okay, advocacy. I have told you about Zoom just now. I've told you you know, about my experience with Zoom. And basically, that's it. So, yeah, basically, those are the three three main things, three main characteristics that you notice about, about um, product-led growth. Uh, so the easiest ways to spot a PLG product is the prices. The prices are always the first, the, um, is always the easiest way to give it away then most of the time, those products are self-service. So you can onboard yourself. You can use the product without reaching out to a support team or a sales, but without a sales person, a sales person reaching out to you. It's very easy to use and it is easily accessible. So that's basically um, how product-led growth works. So in summary, it's just, you know, is an approach to helping you take the customer uh, in, uh, to, you know, get the customer and then convert the customer and then retain the customer. And then the most important aspect of PLG, which is where a lot of us forget to focus on, is the advocacy aspect of it, which is beyond converting that customer. Is that customer advocating for my product? Is that customer telling other people about my product? Okay. So if PLG does all of this, why do you need sales people? Why do you need a sales team in, you know, in um, especially in B2B product-led growth? Okay, so first off, I will define, now, I, don't, I don't think I need to define B2B to anyone here or for anyone here, but basically what B2B is, is you are selling a product that is actually more of a service and you're selling that product to another business. Now, remember that in businesses, you have different categories of people or personas. So you've defined um, in for B2B, for example, the person who is the user of your product is not necessarily the is not necessarily the person who is making the buying decision. The person who has influence to make the influence on the um, what's it called on the buyer may not even be a user. So how do you ensure that? And uh, the, the interesting thing is that all of these people have different requirements. They have different needs. So for example, the user just wants the product to work. The buyer, for example, maybe a CIO or a CTO, just does not want headache, probably wants to fulfill a quota on his um, target, wants to solve a problem for his users, wants to solve that problem within within a price limit or within a budget wants to solve it within a particular time, 
uh, sometimes you even have things like um, you have you have um, things like uh, the nationality of vendors influencing you know buyer decisions. So there are lots of Chinedu will, will talk about how we interact with um, how we interact with buyers uh, when he starts talking about uh, the sales the sales process. But basically, why you need why the easiest way for you to succeed in in B2B, in growing any B2B product is by combining B2, uh, what's it called by combining product-led growth with sales-led growth is because you have multiple, you have different buying processes, you have different needs for every everybody has different needs. So I've already mentioned that your user really just wants a product that works and solves their problem and makes their life easier. A buyer just wants, you know, to solve this problem and move on to the next one. And you need to be able to decipher what each user needs, and you need to be able to, you need to be able to address those needs. So basically, your users need a certain type of interaction, which is where the product comes in, which is why the topic of this conversation, remember, is leading with the product and closing with sales. What does that mean? It means as the uh, what's it called? The user is, you know, the person that goes to use the product, the person that explores. So you want to give that user every opportunity to become an advocate. Remember we talked about advocacy. You want to give that user every opportunity to become an advocate such that they are able to help your case with the buyer. And then the buyer is that person that, you know, the salesperson needs to wear. You can see Chine is wearing suits inside this picture. The salesperson needs to wear suits and tie and whatever else to go and sit down and have presentations with them, have conversations with them, and discuss with them on how to, you know, at how uh, the benefits of adopting that product and all of those things, you know, basically convince that customer. But it is easier to take a value-driven approach to the sale when you've already led with the product because then you have the statistics and you have the data that is showing that person that, look, um, I gave your people access to my product for, I don't know, 30 days. And they were able to do one, two, three, four, five things. It's a different conversation than, ah, please, sir, you know that I have to meet my quarter, the, uh, my, my target this month, and uh, this is the uh, end of quarter. So you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so the second to the last thing I'd like to discuss is just to show you how the, I think I already talked about this, but just to, you know, um, give you a visual representation. So the on your left side, on your left side, let me see if this pencil thing works. On this side, yeah. On this side, I don't know if you can see my pencil, can you? Aha, okay. So on this side, you have a, oh no, it's laser pointer I'm looking for actually. Yeah, this. On this side, you have the typical sales funnel. We will discuss this in um, detail later. Uh, what the sales funnel is is basically the journey, the customer's journey from from um, awareness to retention. Now you notice that in the sales funnel, what you have is at every point in time, there's a human-led um, activity. So at the attract stage. Basically, what you're trying you're trying to attract the customers, you're driving traffic to them. Most of the time, what happens here is um, you're actually directly engaging human beings, whether through cold emails or calls or some other type of engagement. So between attract and interact, um, you're interacting. Uh, what's going? You're engaging with the customer. You're telling the customer. You're showing the customer, you know, the value of what it is that you're trying to sell. And by the time you are able to convince the customer to convert, convert that customer, and then you basically close the sale, which is, you know, we call, uh, most people, sales people call it closing. But on the other side, what you're creating is a cycle. The overall goal of a product-led approach is to minimize the efforts that you need to, con to convert customers, to minimize the, eff the human effort. So basically, you know, doing more with less and doing more, doing more of, you know, doing more conversions with a, a, a leaner team with less resources 
and convert, uh, uh, recruiting customers to become your advocates. So that is what is missing here. It does not mean that this is an incomplete process because what then happens in the typical sales cycle is that the salesperson still goes back to either cross-sell or upsell the customer that they already sold to or you know, to close new customers um, across board. But if you notice, the best way to for, for a B2B product or enterprise product, the easiest and the, you know, the most um, effective way that we have seen in recent times to create a, to create a pool or to create, um, what's it called, to create uh, exponential growth is by combining both of these, both of these methods because they each come in with their values and they have different functions that they, um, that they have different um, effects and, Okay, so I've actually overshot my time by a lot. Uh, let me see, is there anything here that we haven't talked about? Okay, yeah, retention drivers. We talked about the, so we, I've talked about most of these things, uh, the different pricing models for PLG in B2B. So we talked about freemium, we talked about free forever, we talked about graduated and subscription fees. Uh, basically for graduated subscription fees, what you, then have to do as a product manager is to figure out how to prioritize and how to decide what to give your customer access to to be able to basically what your hook is so is it a are you giving them access based on user counts are you giving them access based on features is it a volume is it a team size um, approach that you're going or is it a capacity based approach like um, aws for example uh then retention drivers Automated pricing adjustments, again, another a, 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 AWS is also a great example of this. Then incentivized gamification. So like there are so many different ways of implementing this. So for example, um, I can't remember which product I came across that did this and it was so interesting. You solve a puzzle to get to the next level. And it was so interesting. So like either you get a, uh, you get a referral code or you get a, um, you get a, a, what's that thing called? You get a discount, yeah. So, you know, it's just so interesting how all of these things work together and how they, how they come into play. Uh, I think I need to shut up now so that Chinedu can have some time to tell you about how sales, uh, about the role of sales in, in product-led growth. Chinedu, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much, Yohande. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can. All right. All right, fantastic. Thank you very much, Yohande, for that very insightful context on product-led growth. So, you know, like you've mentioned, what I'll just try to do over the next 15 or 20 minutes, it's, it's just layer the role like sales plays in supporting the activities of a product-led team. All right, just to give an overview of <clears throat> what I'll be talking about over the next 20 or 15 minutes. I just do like a basic introduction to um, sales in comparison with product led. Um, I'd also talk about the evolving role of like sales and like sales strategies as it, as it relates to like product led. Then use like a case study of one of the companies that has successfully you know, transition from a sales-led growth strategy to a product-led growth strategy, then successfully combining those strategies to, to really scale, scale that revenue. So yeah, um, Yewande has given a very, very, very insightful overview of, um, you know, product-led growth, growth, right? And so what is, what is sales-led growth? So over the years, sales has evolved into like different forms. A typical sales team would handle like lead generation, you know, trying to get the customers that would need to utilize their products to closing deals, right? That's actually getting the contract and getting the customers um, to pay money before these deals are handed over, um, you know, to a team called the customer success team that will then manage these opportunities that have been closed to expand and grow the business, right? That's the typical, um, you know, approach in a sales-led strategy. But a lot of things have changed over time. There's been a lot of discoveries in the market. 
a lot of companies are focused on new ways of efficiently taking their products to markets, new ways of providing like value to their customers, and you know, new ways of doing business, businesses in general. And that's pretty much how product-led growth strategies, that's how product-led strategies gained um, traction in the markets. So in a, in a nutshell, right, um, sales teams and product-led teams interact in a way where the primary driver for growth in any organization is through the product. And what does like the primary driver for growth um, mean by using the product? So lead generation happens on the product. That's where, you know, like, for example, mark a product marketing team would have put out some contents in public, maybe like a webinar or maybe like a physical event or maybe um, a blog post. You read that blog post and you find it very interesting. Then it's typically like a call to action that you see on that piece of like marketing content. And that's, you know, call to action will typically lead you um, to the product itself, where you would onboard yourself, right? And um, you only mentioned something very critical about, um, you know, explainer videos and some of the other ways you can learn how to utilize the product on the product itself, right? You probably watch an explainer video and when you watch an explainer video, it teaches you how to sign up, how to use like the core functionalities of the product. And when you do that, you have like a very good understanding of the product. You start to utilize it on a day-to-day -day basis and you get value from the product. If you get value from the product, you can now commit financially, maybe with a monthly plan or maybe with an annual plan um, or maybe like a one-off plan, right? To start utilizing that product. All of these things have happened on the product. But in a sales-led approach, a salesperson would typically pick up the phone, right? Call you out of the blue. I'm like, hey, my name is this. I'm from this. Um, you know, I understand you are this and we want to tell you about this specific product, right? It can be done through like the phone or done through an email. After that happens, maybe um, the customer gives the salesperson some time. The salesperson organizes a demo presentation. You know, they would have to like arrange a time and the salesperson would um, try to inform uh, the customer about the functionalities of the product and how it can benefit the organization. When um, you know, the customer sees some benefits in the product, depending on the size of the organization, right? The customer brings up, brings more people within the organization that may get some value. The salesperson does that um, with these different people again until they finally get to the point where, you know, a contract is sent to the, to the customer and the customer executes the contract and finally pay money before the customer starts using the product. In these two, um, different approaches, the product approach and the sales approach. You can see like one sounds like a very tedious process and one also sounds like a very efficient process, right? A self-self process. But what we are seeing now is a lot of companies have found way to combine these two processes to create a very seamless, a less expensive and an experience that customers would prefer and would happen like really, really fast. That's where you have like a combination of a product-led strategy and a sales-led strategy. And a very critical question to ask is, so why do companies combine these two approaches instead of using one or the other? You have a few companies that are specifically focused on product-led growth strategies. And the reason you would focus on a product-led growth strategies are two things, right? First things first is the size of or the amount or the annual contract value of the product you're selling. So say maybe um, if I want to subscribe to like a Netflix now, right? Netflix does not necessarily need a salesperson to go and do demo presentations and wait for contracts um, before they utilize like Netflix because Netflix is like $9, if I'm not mistaken, a month, right? And at the end of the, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, from one customer, a company would make around like $118 or $108 from one customer. So imagine this, right? A company knows that I'll make $118 from one customer in a whole year. A company does not need to go and hire a salesperson that I'll be probably be paying 
a thousand dollars or three thousand dollars or five k or one k dollars, depending on what it is monthly, as a salary to go and sell, and um, a product that will give me a hundred and eighteen um, you know dollars at the end of the year, right? It doesn't make sense from a cost benefit perspective. That's where you know organizations adopt product led strategies, right? So they do not have to um, burn. Um, you know, burn uh, money on like headcounts, burn money on like infrastructure um, that would pretty much give them a very high customer acquisition cost. And on the long run, they won't be able to break even. So that's like looking at it from a B2C perspective. If you look at it from a B2B perspective, there are different market sizes. So you have like SME, SMB businesses, small and medium scale businesses. You have mid market businesses. And you also have like enterprise businesses, which are like the really, really large organizations, right? So you would find that a lot of businesses that are focused on SMBs, that's like small and medium scale businesses, will typically take a product-led growth approach based on the same principles as well. Because small and medium scale businesses would not be spending enough money on the products on an annual basis that makes it make sense for the organization to invest in building an entire sales team, right? Which which uh, which which pretty much centers around the the annual contract value of like that product and you know the customer acquisition costs, right? That um, the organization needs to expend to sell the products, right? Then you now move up a bit to like mid markets. In the mid markets, you have sort of like an average or like a combination between you know smaller companies and bigger companies, right? You can now start to see like higher annual contract values that can cover, you know, your costs for investing in a product-led infrastructure and also investing in a very small sales team, right? Because at the mid-market level, um, the annual contract values will be much bigger to cover the cost of hiring a sales team and also having a product-led infrastructure. Then you now see that a lot of companies, as they grow, they go from small and medium scale businesses to mid market businesses in terms of who they sell to, and then enterprise businesses. In an enterprise situation, you, you, I, I, I don't want to say you cannot use still evolving, right? It's not, a, it's not like a definite, um, or a, an approach that is cast in stone. But ideally, in more enterprise situations, you find that people actually use sales-led approaches. And the reason people use sales-led approaches in enterprise situations, like Yewanda has mentioned something around that before, is sort of like the dynamics of the different types of buyers in an enterprise situation. So you'd see that in, for example, if you're selling to an SMB, an SMB will pretty much just maybe have like the founder in the management team or have like one or two C-level executives that report to the founder and the rest of the organizations are team members, right? So you probably just need to talk to one of the C-level executives who's probably going to be the user of the solution themselves. So they go on the internet, research a specific problem that they're experiencing. They see this fantastic article that talks about how they solve the problem. You know, the article has a very nice call to action that says get started or, you know, sign up here. And that redirects that C-level person to the solution itself. The person sees a free trial. The person starts a one-month free trial. The person starts to utilize the product and the person sees value in the product. The person goes to the CEO. Hey, I found one solution online. I've tried it out. It solves our problem. You know, let's sign up. CEO releases like, like an expense card or something and they pay. And they start doing that. In the same vein, you know, a salesperson reaches out to that organization after they've done some research about the company and sees that that company fits into their ideal customer profile. They speak to that C-level person, just one person. And, you know, from that one person, they do like a demo presentation. They, um, before they do the demo presentation, they have conversations to really, you know, understand what challenges or what opportunities are within that company. They do a demo presentation of how the solution that they have as salespeople would solve that problem. And instantly, that guy has an authority to make a decision to buy. The guy likes the presentation or the demo that he has seen from the salesperson. The person, okay, commits, yes, we are going to sign up. Please send me the contract. 
once the, once the person receives the contracts, it just gets approval from the you know CEO. Or in some cases, because it's an SMB, it doesn't really need approvals from the CEO. And um, and then, um, it makes a buying decision. But when you now move more up markets, where you know it's typically a sales-led approach, you have something we call a buying team within more enterprise organizations. A buying team is a combination of different people across different departments in the organization, right? Um, that have inputs into sort of like the kind of infrastructure they use, right? So um, in one of the very early sales training that salespeople go to, they teach you about buying influences. So you have things like economic buying influences. That's the department and the person that is responsible for releasing the check to buy that solution. You have teams like the technical buying influences. That's like the department or the person responsible for implementing that solution that they are about to buy. You have teams like the user buying influences. Those are the people within the organizations that will buy, that will utilize the solution, right? This can be IT in a banking scenario. This can be e-business, you know, in other scenarios, this can be, um, this can be uh, operations, right? And, you know, what you see is these are already like four or five different departments with like two or three people that have decision-making authorities within these four or five different departments. So a product, in a product-led approach, uh, it's, it will be very ineffective, right, to portray sort of like the value to these different buying influences across different departments um, to make a decision on what to purchase. You need human interaction, right? And that's where you begin to layer sales on top of a product-led growth strategy. Right, so an organization, um, an organization that has products that they want to take to market that cross cuts across um, SMBs, cross across like mid markets, and also cuts across like enterprise organization. Right, for like their SMB customers and some of their mid market customers, they can take a product led approach. Right, and their more enterprise customers, you know, they take a sales led approach. But what you easily find in those sort of like organizations, they lead with products, right? And when they lead with products, some of the things the sales teams do in collaboration with like product marketing teams is try to take advantage of the data they have gathered, right? From onboarding across so many companies. So for example, um, I'm a KPMG and I want to, I'm a, maybe let, let me say I'm a head of ops or I'm just an operations team member, um, you know, in KPMG. And, you know, um, I have a problem with managing people and I go online and I try to find an article on how I can manage my people better. You know, I go to, it redirects me to a website. The website says, you know, impute your in email, impute your name, impute the name of the company you're from, um, before you can download this article. It's called a gated article. And once, once you do that, your information is fed into the systems of that company, right? Now, somebody gets that information. Obviously, when you do that, you also have, um, you know, access to like maybe a freemium or a free trial or, or, or whatever on how to, on getting access to like that solution, right? You utilize the solution. Everything is nice or well and good. You start to have some more conversations internally. Maybe you go and tell your manager, hey, I just found one solution online. You know, that's really, that's really helped me solve this problem. Your manager will go and tell the head of departments. The head of departments will go and tell a C level, you know, but before all those things happen, the team has already collected that data. That's the sales team has collected that data from the product -like team. They've seen, hey, KPMG is an enterprise organization. They have almost like 15,000 staff. This fits like the profile of a company that would have a very large buying team, right? Let's engage this person, you know, that has downloaded this article, right? Let's see if it can connect us to all the other buying influences. Let's have conversations with them. And, you know, help them make a more informed decision on purchasing these products, right? This is where, this is where, um, you know, and this is how a sales team supports the product led motion in any organization, right? Selling from an SMB perspective, you know, to, to an enterprise, um, perspective, right? I think in some of the things that like I mentioned now, I've, I've talked a bit about how, um, the sales role, has evolved, right? Especially to support the product-led growth team 
you know, I've talked about the shift in sales teams' roles, right? But I can provide some more context there. So let's talk about how the role of sales team is changing, you know, in this product-led growth context. Remember, like I mentioned earlier, sales used to be like the main growth engine in traditional models where, you know, we just have sales team. But, you know, that's not the case, any- case anymore. Now that we have like more products in the spotlight, sales teams are now taking a more supportive and you know facilitative um, approach and role to supporting um, the product-led sales motions, right? And I sort of try to touch and explain that, um, talking about how companies move up markets from SMBs um, to enterprise organizations, and also how like the sales team sales teams leverage data that has been collected from a product-led motion to um, find buying influences within really large organizations um, to close deals faster and also like make, make um, do like upsells and, and do like um, cross sales, right? So this is exactly what um, a sales team looks like in the context um, of supporting a, a product-led environment, right? And... I mean, one of the things I, I really like to point out here is, is, is very essential, right? Regardless of the organization you find yourself, um, especially an organization that sells to different markets, the SMB markets, the mid markets, and sort of like enterprise organization, is really important for this type of organizations to find a way, um, you know, to, to, to execute a hybrid strategy in terms of like a product-led strategy, and in terms of like a sales-led strategy. Because like I mentioned earlier, if you want to utilize a purely sales-led strategy, especially for your um, you know, SMB customers or your mid-market customers, you'd have a very high customer acquisition cost, right? Which means you may never break even. You may never become profitable. You just keep burning more money to generate um, sort of like less revenue, right? And that's where like the product-led strategy really comes in to help you reduce that customer acquisition cost and help you get to a point of break even faster. And also, um, you know, from a customer and user experience perspective, it provides a more valuable user experience, right? If I'm just one man in one organization that needs a product right now that will solve the challenge that I want to solve right now, I don't need a salesperson calling me to tell me they want to book five meetings or book three meetings that would really help me understand how a product can help me solve my problems. I would, I, I am educated enough and the internet provides enough information for me to get insight on how I would solve that problem, right? So I just want to go online. I want to go through a customer journey that will lead me to something that educates me on how to solve my problem. And, you know, when he educates me on how to solve that problem, it leads me to something that will show me what I will use to solve that problem and also how much I will be spending, you know, to solve that problem in as little as maybe 10 to 15 clicks as against, you know, 10 to 15 meetings with a physical salesperson, right? That will take weeks and probably months, right? In the same vein, on the enterprise side, right, um, a company needs to provide enough insights to the different buying influences um, especially regarding what value they would get from utilizing the solution. Like Iwan they mentioned earlier, a, C- a CEO or somebody that's an economic buyer, right? The value that person is going to get from, you know, utilizing your solution is not the same a user buying influence would, would get. A CEO would probably just want to like save costs, create a better, um, a better customer experience, increase shareholder value, right? How's your problem going to solve that for the CEO? In a product-led environment, right, it's a bit more difficult to do that for a CEO because a CEO may not have time to be going through the thousands of articles that you have online and going to like sign up on your products and going to do like free trials. A CEO just wants to see, you know, three bullet points of, you know, how I'm, how this is going to help me reduce costs in like 30 seconds or like one minute because they never have time. How this is going to help me. Um, you know, improve my customer experience and how this is going to help me improve shareholder value, right? And that's like the job of a salesperson to do that, like with a CEO, right? Then also a technical buying influence, which is like the people who would implement the solution in an enterprise organization would want to see how the back end would work, 
what kind of APIs they use, the REST APIs, you know, what kind of enterprise infrastructure they have. While a lot of product-led contacts can provide that to an engineering or an implementations team, right? You have yeah. a lot of um, you have a lot of CTOs that are buying influences as well that will not have time to go and read all those your API documentations or read all those your product marketing content that you have made available on Google and stuff. They just want somebody who can really just come in and answer like five to six questions that can get them interested in starting the conversation with an expert that can come and talk about, you know, the technical aspect of the solution. And that's where a sales team really comes in. So at the end of the day, this is how the sales role has evolved to really support like the product-led motion in an organization where they are thinking of combining both strategies to generate more revenue and improve uh, like the customer experience, right? Yeah, they are certain things that you know a sales team or a salesperson does in a product-led um, growth environment, right? Like they identify high-value customers. And this is what I exactly mentioned with enterprise organizations, right? Using the KPMG scenario, right? Where, you know, a salesperson would leverage the data that has come from the product-led motion to identify larger organizations, right? That may have larger buying teams and use that data and provide more insights to those organizations to accelerate the buying process and create like a better customer experience um, for higher value customers, right? They would also pe- provide a personalized sales approach. And this is sort of like what I mentioned with, you know, a CEO just wants to know how they would um, save costs, improve customer experience, and increase shareholder value. A CTO wants to know how sort of like the infrastructure investments they need to do before they, like, they implement that solution. So sort of like it's kind of like technologies that have been utilized in, you know, building that solution and what they will need to implement. And, you know, Without having a personalized experience um, with either the CEO or the CTO, it will be very difficult for them, right, in the time and the channel that they want to use to consume that information to get it through just a product-led motion. They will want somebody who is a subject matter expert about the solution itself, which is the product that they're selling, and also the markets that the customer operates in to talk about how the sort of like the challenges they're experiencing in the market and how that product can help them achieve those specific bullet points of things that they really want to achieve. That's where a personalized sales approach that complements a product-led strategy um, really comes in. And expanding and upselling as well, right? Um, which would typically be called a customer success function. But what we see based on like the economic climates that we are experiencing now, and as the market evolves more, um, organizations are looking to achieve more with less investments. And the key performance indicator to really check how that is working is your customer acquisition cost, right? I'm sure in, in sort of like from where Ye One Day has spoken and some of the things I've mentioned now, you'd have heard customer acquisition costs at least like seven times, right? And reducing customer acquisition costs and breaking even faster in terms of like revenue generation, in terms of like profitability, and in terms of like accelerated efficient growth is one of like the foundations on what product-led growth strategy is built upon, right? So um, expanding and upselling is no longer just a customer success function. You have a lot of sales teams and customer success teams, that's what they do within the customer journey overlaps right now, right? You have people that are called business development managers or sales managers that are going to upsell and cross-sell, um, you know, are going to like expand accounts. You have people called customer success managers right now that are looking for white spaces within accounts to try to find new things that they can sell, right, to increase revenue, right? So customers, um, organizations are looking to are looking looking for ways that they can collapse these Chinese walls across these different roles in the sales motion to ultimately, you know, reduce um, the costs um, they expend on acquiring like new customers and um, you know achieving a positive 
uh, you know, LTV to CAC ratio. Now, um, I, I'll just talk a bit about LTV to CAC ratio for like 20 seconds, right? LTV is, is li lifetime value, right? That is pretty much if a customer, you know, buys my, my products, um, from when they buy that product, right. the amount of money a customer spends from when they purchase your solution, right? Up until, you know, if they churn or if they don't churn, right? If you are with you for 10 years, right? That's the amount of money that you see as your LTV, right? Then customer acquisition cost on the other end is how much you used, right? Or how much you spent in like sales, marketing, infrastructure to close that customer, right? And a very healthy place that organizations like to be is an LTV to CAC ratio of like four to one, right? Meaning for every one Naira I spend, I must have made or I must make four Naira from, um, you know, this customer I spent it on, right? So, and that four Naira that has made must cover, you know, my capital expenditure, must cover my operational expenditure, must cover sort of like the taxes I'll pay, profit after tax, and every goddamn expense I need to pay. Then I'll now come out with maybe a, a profit to CAC ratio of like maybe one to two or one to three or whatever, right? That's a very healthy scenario, right? And that's why businesses are looking to break sort of like all these Chinese walls within these different roles, right? They want to like dismantle all these barriers and all these things that are increasing their customer acquisition costs where you have somebody generating leads, you're paying that person salaries for one customer. You have another person closing that deal. You're paying that person salary for that one customer. And you also have somebody like as a customer success person, you know, that is now managing and expanding that account. You're, also, you're paying three different salaries for one customer, right? A lot of organizations see this as the best approach and it works for a lot of organizations. You also have a lot of organizations that are trying to like dismantle these barriers and just use, um, you know, um, a more efficient um, go-to-market strategy that combines product-led and the sales-led um, strategy in acquiring customers and expanding their lifetime value. All right. Now that we have talked a bit about, you know, what a product-led growth strategy looks like, what a sales-led growth strategy looks like, I'll take like the next three minutes um, or less to just try to talk about like sales enablement. And what the goal of like enable, let me not even call it sales enablement, enablement in the product led and sales strategy, right? The goal of enablement is to create that alignment between how the customer transitions from a product led approach to like a sales led approach in a journey, right? And it's very important because one of the things you see in a lot of companies that have a hybrid strategy like this is there will be a lot of drop offs between when the customers go through a product-led motion and when they transition to like a sales-led motion, right? Which becomes ultimately more expensive for the organization and defeating and defeats like the, the, the purpose of a combined or a hybrid strategy. So how do organizations achieve this? Let me just run through this quick. So first things first, there needs to be an alignment on the metrics that they use to track sort of like what does success mean for this, um, you know, hybrid motion that we have created. You're looking at um, you're looking at um, you know metrics like conversion rates across like the different touch points from PLGs um, to like the sales touch points. You're looking at like the lagging indicators also like customer acquisition cost and lifetime value of customers. You're looking like um, indicators like you know how many customers came through our you know our probably our blog posts that transitioned to utilizing the product our freemium. And how many, you know, customers used our freemium and transitioned, you know, to actually a paying customer that stays with us to cover our entire customer acquisition cost and improve our lifetime value. These are a couple of things that you need to see. And a couple of things that you also need to do is organizations that want to like do hybrid strategies also need to invest heavily in training because salespeople have their specific types of trainings and product led people have their specific type of training. You need to invest in what we call a hybrid training that has sort of like the customer and the customer's journey in mind. And there is no PLG and sales strategy that are typically the same across different organizations, except maybe you are in the same industry, you have the same products, you're selling to the same type of customers, the goals that you guys have set for yourselves as different organizations are the same things, right? 
So you not you can now see, okay, I have information about what these guys have done. I can replicate it. But it's usually different and it usually comes from inward in terms of designing the learning experience for your sales team and your product leg team in a way you know, that is aligned. And at the center of all of this is your you know, tech stack that you have. You know, there are several tools that are utilized from the product-led side you know, to the sales-led side. On the product-led side, you have marketing tools, you have like analytics tools, you have content creation tools. Um, on the sales-led side, you have CRM tools. You have some of these tools as well. You know, you have like the Salesforce, you have like the HubSpot, you have like the Pipedrive, um, you have like email marketing tools. And all of these tools have to be aligned to pretty much help you um, achieve those KPIs that you have set out, right? And also the trainings need to be aligned in terms of utilizing this tool to drive results that drives you closer to achieving those KPIs that you have also set out for your customers, right? Um, I, would, I, would, I would have given a typical example um, one of the very popular companies called HubSpot and how they transitioned from a sales strategy um, to a product-led strategy and ultimately landing in a combination of a hybrid strategy that uh, involves sales and product-led. Uh, but we are sort of like out of time. But, and I feel like I have covered that very deeply when I talk about moving up markets from SMB to mid markets and um, you know enterprise markets. So yeah, Yewande, I think um, at this junction, I think I pretty much covered all of the areas um, from introduction to like the evolving role of like sales and you know the key sales strategies in a product-led growth environment, enabling sales and you know product-led growth teams. And um, yeah, I hope you know with all of these insights that I've prov uh, provided, um, one or two people here would have learned a few things about. The alignment between sales and um, a product like growth strategy. What about you, Wendy? Thank you so much, Chineju. This has been an awesome conversation. Like I just shared a post that I think this is the best conversation we've had in a while. Um, well, technically, this is our first webinar, Shabo. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, um, okay. So, thank you so much. Um, like I said, it's been a great conversation and I'm sure that, you know, like Chine said, you guys have been able to pick up a few things, even if not everything that we've talked about. Uh, so we've covered from, you know, what exactly is product-led growth to how product-led growth works to how it, um, how there's an, uh, what the integration between uh, the product team and the sales team should be in an organization that is intentional about leading with the product and closing with sales so uh what are the peculiarities of building of growing b2b in in nigeria in an african market i think we've talked about in fact we really explored the the details of you know the buying process the buyer types and and um, the approaches to engaging those different kinds of buyers We've identified some issues that we think we think that we've noticed from our experience, from our cumulative experiences, you know, dealing with um, selling enterprise solutions and interacting with enterprise customers, as well as so that's from a core sales perspective to also a product development and product and growth perspective. So this this has been our own experience. So number one is long lead times. Lead time is how long it takes to close a sale. And because of the bureaucratic nature of most enterprise organizations, it takes, you know, a long time because most of the time you're talking to you're talking to different hierarchies of people, different levels of people, and everybody, every level needs to approve before it gets to the next level. You have multiple stakeholders that need to be carried along. You have different people that need some level of um, so you have different you know kinds of people so you have influencers you have um, actual buyers you have so there's that then corruption is everywhere so there is that as well then there are price wars so typically what happens in you know larger organizations is you have um, <clears throat> excuse me you have multiple approved vendors or sometimes you have new vendors coming in. 
And because one person has, again, back to corruption, because one person has interests or vested interests um, by way of kickbacks in a particular vendor getting a deal, they actually, I've seen it happen quite a number of times. The Someone internally would share the price of one vendor and tell you, look, if you want to get the deal, you need to match this price or go lower. And this happens in you know small to medium small to medium businesses as well from the perspective of even from a PLG perspective like you're literally fighting price wars with your competitors because as much as you try to differentiate as much as everybody has a USP it's still the most of the time people sometimes don't look beyond the price for the first you know for the first level of conversion so these are the things that we have that we have identified and a few things that, you know, along the lines of product-led growth that can help to solve these problems. One is a clear messaging in what the product value is. So you're encouraging customers to try out your product. They need to see what the value is. They need to, they need to be able to perceive, not just perceive, they need to be able to, uh, what's the English? They need to be able to evaluate the product and immediately, understand what the value is. So recently somebody reached out to me and said, oh, Yoni, I'm trying, I'm building something. I want you to help me look at it. So I did. And the first thing I said to her was, I don't understand what you're building. I don't understand what you're trying to tell me. I looked through the entire website. I looked at the product. I I, I, I didn't get it. So the, to be fair, I understood it because, you know, I'm a product person. I was able to dig deep. I could understand what she was trying to say with the messaging. But we need to understand that the first point of contact to the customer is your website. If your website does not communicate the value that you're trying to sell, just say bye-bye. Um, okay. Then strategic Feature prioritization, yes. Yeah. So remember, I mentioned the hook earlier with um, when you're when you're building, when you're you know leading with the product. So the hook is basically that thing that makes that person wants to pay for the premium version of that product, and that's it. So for example, what is Zoom's hook? Their hook is on the free version. You can do a maximum of forty minutes. You can't um, the number of other things, but you know. The minute you move to the next level, you have access to quite a number of things that are actually important to you as a user. As an evaluator, uh, yeah, I can do the 40 minutes and, you know, it's fine. I can do 30 minutes calls. But if you want to, so for example, this, okay, in fact, perfect. This meeting is not a webinar, for instance. This meeting is a regular meeting. When I was setting up this meeting, they asked me, this looks like a webinar. Do you want to, do you want to, uh, do you want to convert this to a webinar? And I clicked yes, and the thing popped up, um, pay for the, I said, no, thank you very much. Uh, okay, so then we talked about selling in selling in partnership with um, leading with the product. So value-based selling, it's, sales is not, sales, a lot of people think that sales, well, anyway, thankfully, sales has, or rather sales people, like Chinedu said, training is extremely important. And I think these days we've been able to equip a lot of our, of our sales teams and let them understand, you know, a scientific approach to selling. Selling is not, oh, please now come and buy. You know, you have to help me meet my targets. Mm -mm. Selling is, look, I have this thing to sell and this thing will solve problem one, two, three for you. I have done my research. I see that you have this problem. I know that you have not been able to solve that problem. Or you have tried X and X did not work out for you. If you try my product, my product will give you Y, Z, and A. So that is value-based selling. Then optimize customer journey. So I talked about messaging earlier. Messaging and customer journey go hand in hand. Uh, you want your customer to try a product, but before they even get to the point where they find the value, they have read my road and gone around and around. Everybody's tired. Nobody's interested in all of that. And you're not the only one selling product. And you're, not, you're not the only one solving that same problem. Like in the world, at least, even the most innovative product, the newest product in the world has competition. So, hello. Uh, okay. 
Then, so basically, you know, learn from user behavior, understand what users are looking for, and data, God, I cannot stress this enough. Data is the most important, there's, there's something I always say, data is the most important tool in a product manager's arsenal. You need to understand how, to, it's not just to collect the data, you need to understand how to interpret the data, you need to understand how it affects the success of your product, you need to understand what your customers are looking for. And support is extremely important as well. We talked about customer success as a key team in PLG earlier. Support is not going anywhere. Uh, whether it is remote, whether it is on site, whether it is, support is not going anywhere. Support is extremely important. We need to be able to help customers realize the value that they are looking for. They need to, we need to be able to, if a customer is having issues, we need to, we need to pre be preemptive and proactive such that we're able to help the customers solve their problems before they even, you know, before they get bored and tired and abandon the product. Uh, then metrics to watch out for. What's your churn rate? What's your net promoter score? What are people saying about your product? If you go to um, App Store, what's the rating? What are the comments? What's the feedback from customers? What are your customers telling your support team? What is your support team telling your technology team? What is, you know, a lot of different things. And then what are your conversion rates? Conversion rates occur at different levels. So conversion from each stage. What is the percentage of conversion you have from awareness to adoption? What is the percentage from adoption to, um, uh, what's it called, to retention? How much of your customers that you converted are staying for what period? How much are you making from them? What is your overall CAC? What is your CAC ratio to LTV? All these things, you talked about this as well. It's very important to understand the importance of all of these with respect to the size of your business, the um, stage of your product. So for example, products at um, introduction stage would naturally be a lot more open to taking on higher cost of acquisition than products at growth stage. Because ideally, at introduction stage, you know, you're just getting into the market. You need people to need to know you, and people need to understand what it is that you're doing uh, before they get comfortable with the product. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chinedu, for sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you very much, everyone. This has been an awesome session. I'm very grateful for the attendance. I'm sure that everybody has gotten one or two things from here. Thanks, guys. Bye. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thanks, Yawande. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Yawande. Thank you, Shinodu.